Hi, welcome to Free Advice Friday. My name is Carrie Barnum. I am the Executive Director of New Shelves Books, and we are here for Free Advice Friday, the hour every Friday where we get together to talk about book marketing, publishing, what's happening in the industry. We help encourage each other, and we answer your questions live. You can join us at newshelves.com slash FAF, or you can also email your questions in advance to info, I-N-F-O, at newshelves.com. We do put our replays up on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to our channel. It's just youtube.com slash newshelvesbooks. Try to make it easy for you. And we've got some questions live that I will be answering. So those of you on our live call know if you have chat questions, please put them in the chat. Or if you want to chat, we chat a lot. If you want to chat, put it in the chat box. If you have questions, put it in the Q&A box so I don't lose it because we have a chatty group, which I love. All right. The first question I have here is, is there any difference in the contracts that agents present to authors or are all their contracts essentially the same in terms of royalty percentage and any other key elements? So what I have found there is that when agents are offering contracts, they tend to each have their own standard contract, which falls within the realm of kind of normal within the publishing and agent industry. With that said, one agent's contract or one uh, agency's contract may be different than another's. They may say that they have the right to represent you for film, uh, for film, audio, and print rights they may have a different percentage they may have a like a time limit if they can't sell your book in x amount of time then your contract ends um so there are little details in there the basics are fairly standard it's kind of what's in the norm but they will be slightly different um so i would read any contract carefully just to make sure that you are in agreement and there are always those bad apples, just like we know that some publishers are fantastic and sometimes publishers are not what they seem. So can agents be the same. Some of them can have things that are a little shady in their contract because we are human and that's what <laughs> that's what humanity does, right? So I would make sure that you read carefully. And yes, there may be some differences. Also keep in mind if the agent really, really wants to represent an author, especially if that author already has a reputation, a name, a following, they may be willing to negotiate on fees and different things like that. So it's not like one universal contract that everyone uses and that's what it is. It definitely can change depending on the agency, depending on the agent, and depending on the book or author itself. So read through those carefully to make sure that you are really getting the contract that you want. Um, all right, in telling my social self-publishing group about the closure of Donahue, many of them said a PCIP block isn't necessary. Bookstores, libraries have the ISDN. What are your thoughts? I think that those people probably aren't in the industry professionally. Um, here's the thing, and I have always said this. A PCIP block is not required to get into libraries. It's not. However, it is a convenience feature that may help librarians choose to stock your book. And as a self-published author, unless you have a big brand and lots of sales, you need every leg up that you can get. So can a library buy your book and then catalog it themselves? Absolutely, they can. However, if you are asking them to catalog your book, I have talked to librarians in the last couple of years, it can go into a cataloging room for up to two years. If you've got two years of books stacked up in a room, not getting into circulation, are you likely to buy another book without a PCIP block? No, you're not. Um, also, it is something that the trade publishing industry does provide. So if you are trying to excel, if you are trying to get up to the level of trade publishing and be regarded with that same respect, a PCIP block does help. So is it required? Absolutely not. Especially if libraries are not your goal. Keep in mind, bookstores don't care PCIP block doesn't matter to them, not their thing. This is for libraries specifically. So if you have, let's say a workbook, something that people write in, 
Libraries don't want that typically. So does a PCIP block make sense for that book? Probably not. But for a fiction novel, for a children's book, that's when I recommend it. And especially if you know that you want the library market, if you've got an academic book, you're hoping to get into libraries. I highly recommend it. So is it required? No. But I think the feeling of that, and when people say you don't need a PCIP block, the, that is often the crowd that will also say, you don't need to buy your own ISBNs. You can get the free one from KDP. Can you do it? Yes. If you are trying to excel and publish at a higher level, highly disagree with that. So, um, look, we have we have words from a cataloger. So Dave is going to back me up here and say highly, highly recommended. So again, I know that can sound kind of snooty. It can, but there is a way to publish books to get them out on the market and there is a way to publish books professionally to be regarded in the market in such a way that you can get stocked at libraries and bookstores and if you want to be on that level if you want to increase your chances of being stocked in a library on bookstore shelves then we kind of have to follow those traditional norms and i'll leave i'll leave it at that all right let's all right i had another emailed question or it might have been questions that i'm going to follow up on all right this person did email and say it was a jumbled series of questions so we're gonna have to to tease them out a little bit i think all right the first question amazon author copies are taking forever to ship um, I ordered my first batch nine days ago, and there's not yet any update on the order status. Is this typical? How are authors supposed to navigate this when they're trying to promote a book, and especially when preparing for events? So let me take that question first. Number one, how quickly your books will process depends on, honestly, how overwhelmed Amazon is for sales. We are right now right at Easter. Easter is a really big buying holiday. So I imagine Amazon's warehouse is pretty busy. Number two, how many books did you order? Did you order one or two copies or did you order 50 copies? Because that is absolutely going to change whether or not you get your books quickly. Um, also, do you have a kind of a standard book? Do you have something more specialty? Do you have a children's book with full color or are you working a novel that's a typical five by eight or six by nine? These are all factors that can really go into how quickly you get books. And another thing to realize is that author copies take a back seat to retail sales because you wanna make the customer happy and so does Amazon. So if there are people ordering books online for retail and there are authors ordering copies, they are going to make sure that those retail orders that are typically promised through Prime in two days are getting precedent. So that is something that you wanna consider as well. Now, as an author, how can you plan events? How can you do things? My recommendation is that typically order in advance, I would never allow less than two to three weeks minimum to order author copies for an event. And that's that's pretty cutting it close for KDP. Ingram Spark, I would allow at least a month to order copies. Keep in mind shipping time. And then on top of that, if you are knowingly going into author events, I would recommend that you keep some stock on hand at your house. Now, does that mean you need 3,000 copies sitting in your garage? No, however, a box or two of books, you should always have those on hand. You never know when you want to hand sell, when you have an event, when there is someone you meet. I mean, you should always have a couple of books at your house, either boxes of books if you have one or two titles, or if you have more titles, maybe not as many, but you should have your own stock on hand for things such as this. So I highly recommend that. And yes, I do realize it's upfront expense when you're not sure when you're going to sell them, but that is kind of the part of having a business.
If I am running a business, um, I don't know, making t-shirts. Well, if I want to be able to produce those t-shirts and get them out to the customer, I need a stock of t-shirts in hand. Um, doesn't mean I won't ever have an order so big that I need to order more, but I can't expect to sell something I don't have product of in my warehouse or in, in my garage or my guest room, you know. So highly recommend that. And also again, KDP is typically faster for author copy books. However, it is definitely dependent on how busy the Amazon warehouse is and the quantity you order. Ingram Spark is typically much slower and their shipping is slower. So keep that in mind that if you're ordering from Ingram Spark, you need to give yourself plenty of time to order author copies. Um, it's just kind of the, the name of the game. All right, let's see. And I will say that even with print on demand, it's a heck of a lot faster than books that you're ordering offset the big publishers. I am working with someone right now, um, big print run, bigger name, bigger, you know, just bigger. And they are ordering large quantities. I think the first print run is going to be 10,000. And these books have to go in this week, the full manuscript, all files have gone this week to get their books printed by August. They won't even get them until the end of August. So print on demand is still way faster than just about anything else, but everyone's backed up and there have been supply chain issues and trucker issues where they're not getting shipped and all sorts of things. So it's kind of just the world we live in and we've got to plan and roll with those punches where we can. And the second question, uh, I'd love to get my book into the hands of school groups and nonprofits with whom its message, which is overcoming trauma might resonate. Any recommendations as to the logistics of pitching such a thing? Example, providing some free copies or selling at a discount for my stash of author copies. I want to foster the connection and make it easier for people to get access, but without eating too much into potential sales. So I would say if you were trying to pitch organizations, schools, groups, absolutely offer a review copy to whoever is organizing that. If it's a teacher, if it is a, I don't know, the leader of some trauma group or something like that, you offer a review copy to the decision maker. And then what you do is you offer discount bulk buy and you decide what that bulk buy is. Maybe it's five copies or 10 or 20, but you say, if you decide that you would like this for your group, I am very happy to offer you a discount of 20%, 30%, 40%. Keeping in mind that trade retail is a 40% discount. Um, so you may decide to go as low as that, but a lot of times 20 to 30% somewhere in there works just fine for organizations. They appreciate that you're giving them the discount. You can order author copies and sell them that way, which means you make more than if you sold them directly through Ingram Spark and it works out for everybody. You make money, they get a discount, everyone's happy. But I would not be giving an entire group free copies unless you had a very specific reason for it. Because when you're a business person, you have to expect to give some, some product away, right? It's a sample, but you don't wanna give all the goods away. You need to make your profit, your money. And also you don't want to devalue your product by just throwing it out there. You want to make sure that it's, you know, you create the value of your book, of your expertise by saying, here's this book and I will give it to you. But then, you know, the rest, I'll give you a discount, great deal. Now that is organizations. And I know we've got some people on here. I can, I can almost see your faces through Zoom going, but you recommend free book giveaways on eBooks. And yes, I do. However, that's just a leader magnet. If you were doing a free book giveaway for your ebook or a discount ebook, I highly recommend that's a great way to get more readers, more reviewers, and that can be very effective. However, the difference is, is that you are not paying $5 per copy for that. You are also, I only recommend doing this if you're getting something in return, if you're getting reviewers, if you have a series and you're using that as a loss leader and you are then getting um, read through on a series. And even with that, with free discounts or uh, um, ebook discounts, 
I lost my words. Uh, I highly recommend that you don't overdo that. When people are constantly putting a book free or constantly running the best deal ever, um, it devalues it. It's like, you know, the companies where it's always a discount, it's the closeout sale. Well, I can think of companies around me that have been having closeout sales for like five years and they're still open. So what do I do when they say closeout sale, biggest sale ever? I tune them out because I think, nah, it'll be another closeout sale next week. So there's that to consider as well. You don't want to devalue your product. You want to be very thoughtful of how you give things away and sell your book. You put a lot of work and effort into it and it's worth the money. And you have to believe that. If you don't believe that and you aren't willing to ask to be paid for your work, why would anyone else value your work? You really have to do that. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard to say, well, the product is worth this. And we do want to make sure we're in market value and we're realistic, but absolutely. Would you go to work for a full day and say, yeah, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay me. Um, you may volunteer for things once in a while, but not day after day, because as I always say, kids got to eat, you need a roof over your head. And if you want to sustain yourself as an author, even if it's only paying, if you're kind of doing it more as a hobby, if you want to sustain your writing and continue to write, well, then you've got to at least try to cover those costs, right? So think of it that way. And don't be afraid to ask for a sale. I think that's really, really important. All right, those are my email questions. That was not too bad. That was not too jumbled, by the way. That's right, show me the money. That's a great movie. Um, okay, one of the things I wanted to talk about is this new change for, I believe it's Nook Books and iBooks because of Google Play. I don't know if you have heard this, and this matters mostly if you have your eBooks wide. So if your eBook is in Kindle Unlimited, this real, won't really affect you. But if your ebooks are wide, if you use draft to digital and your ebooks are wide, you may or may not have heard that Google Play essentially was like, they are for Android phones, Android phones and apps and devices. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't touched iPhone yet, but who knows? Um, essentially what happened is they were like, okay, well, you're using Google apps, the Nook app and the, um, they wouldn't have iBooks. That would just be Nook. Um, anyway, you're using our app to make sales Barnes and Noble. So we want some money for it. And what Barnes & Noble said was, no, we're not going to give you any money for sales you, that people, you know, buy when they're using an Android. And so Google Play said, all right, well, we're going to take our buy button off. So that sounds kind of confusing. But the end result is Google Play wants a cut of all sales for Android de devices for Nook. They want their cut because you're using their product. Nook doesn't want to pay it. Barnes Noble doesn't want to pay it. So then it's, does Nook pay it? Does the author pay more, um, a more of a cut when they make a Nook sale through Google or through a Google Android device? I don't know why I keep saying device instead of device. Anyway, so how do we work in there? And so Google's like, well, while you figure that out, we are going to remove the buy button on Google devices that use Nook. And what that means is that people using Google devices for Nook books now have to go to barnesandnoble.com. They have to buy the book on Nook, and then they have to send it and download it to their Nook device. Okay, so they can still get the book. Why does that matter? Well, because as we've talked about before, the more clicks you have to make, the less conversion you will have. So authors who really depend on wide sales, who have a lot of Barnes & Noble or Nook sales, are seeing a shift in that because people don't want to make that many clicks. They want to have in-app purchasing, and that's not available right now on Android devices. And 
typically, I will say typically, people who use Android devices are the people using the Nook app because people who have iPhones are typically going to use iBooks. So there's definitely a shift in a pool and I'll be interested to see where that ends and how it actually turns out. But as of right now, there are no buy buttons in the Nook app. So if you are wide, you may want to consider that when you're linking to Barnes and Noble for sales, it may be kind of going down. So it's something to watch. It's something to keep an eye on if that is a big part of your business. I know some people who have a lot of uh, wide sales and I know a lot of people who really have a lot of Amazon or Kindle Unlimited sales. So know your sales, know where your money comes from and keep an eye on that if it's affecting your business as an author. Okay, do I need a new PCIP? Um, for a new version of my book. Yes, if you are putting out a new book with a new ISBN, it does have to be recataloged. You cannot use an old um, ISBN edition PCIP in your new book. So that is important to note that if you have a new ISBN, you need a new cataloging block. It does not transfer over. I've seen people try, um, but that's not how it works because all of the information, including the ISBN, is uploaded to the OCLC system, to the Sky River system. These are online databases that when they upload the information, it goes by ISBN. So if you try to take this block of information and just change your ISBN, they're not going to find it in those systems. And then it's not very helpful. So it's really important that you do up, um, update and catalog for the ISBN. Do keep in mind that Donahue Group is still open through the end of this month, and you should be sending PCIP requests into them. After that, Donahue Group will be closing, and we are going personally at New Shelves. We're going to give the Cassidy uh, Cataloging Group a try. Where you go after that is up to you, but that's where I'm going to try. And if you do use Casty, make sure you're mentioning that you were previously a Donahue customer and they will waive the setup fee for your first time, which is fantastic of them. All right, if you've got questions, put them in the Q&A. We still have some time here. Have I heard of book talk? Yes. Uh, yes, we've talked about book talk quite a bit and TikTok, and I think it can be fabulous. I was actually talking last week about how sometimes with book talk, we're actually seeing it more with book reviewers than authors. I have heard of authors who have had a lot of success using TikTok with the hashtag book talk. Um, however, I, I've seen a lot of authors say I had great success when other people reviewed my book with the book talk um, hashtag. So certainly a thing, if you are interested in working in TikTok, just know to get the algorithms in there, you really need to be posting between one and three times a day. And it does need daily interaction, commenting on other posts, posting. So it is kind of a, um, a high needs app as far as your time and getting in there. So it may be a bit of work. <laughs> Exactly. It's not for everybody, but also it's not for every audience. It is typically a female driven audience, a younger audience. Um, when you get older, not as many people are on TikTok. So if your book is something that really appeals to the over 50 crowd, not saying none of them are on TikTok, but marginally less. Um, and also, again, women tend to be bigger users on TikTok as of right now. So if I changed my cover size, but the material is still the same, do I need a new PCIP? Yes, because when you change your cover size, you must change your ISBN. And when you change it an ISBN, you need a new PCIP. So yes. Now, if you had definitely for cover size, um, for cover size, you absolutely do need to change your ISBN. If you're going from glossy to matte, or you're going from white paper to cream paper, or little things like that, you do not have to change your ISBN, but for cover size, you do. And 
Randy's little comment on the side. My son, we were eating. I may regret this later when like the police come knocking, but we're sitting at dinner and I, I had made um, skin on chicken thighs and they were crispy like chicken skin. And that's like the best part, right? So we're sitting there eating it. My son's eating this crispy chicken skin and he goes, and he's just eating very thoughtful. And he goes, if chicken skin tastes this good, I wonder, I wonder how good human skin is. My husband and I, both of it, you know, like when you're like, did I, did I hear that right? Did I hear that right? We kind of look up at each other and then look down again. And then I look at him and I was like, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> Why does that come up? And he was just going, well, I don't know. Do you think my skin would get this crispy? So absolutely the curiosity of an eight-year-old, which I just love. I thought it was so funny. And I was like, and of course my husband and I are both like afterwards, I was like, so did you get silence of the lamb vibes? Any fear there? Um, but he's actually, he's the sweetest, most tender hearted kid, but it was just so funny. I was like, we are in the wrong, the wrong country, the wrong time probably to find out what human skin tastes like. And I don't think that we actually want to. And he agreed. He was like, yeah, probably not. The chicken skin's pretty good. Silence of the chicken. Dun, dun, dun. All right. <laughs> Would it be bland? Maybe. All right. And I love the people telling me uh, what human skin tastes like. I hope that's not from personal experience. Just going to say. All right. Which cover size would you recommend for a um, children's picture book? Ooh, uh, I think you need to go to your market and see what kind of book you have. Um, or is it a children's picture book? Is it, what audience is it for? Is it a coffee table book? Is it a children's picture book? Which age range? How many pages do you have? Is this a photography book or an illustrated book? All of these things really go into trim size. So that is one of those things that you really need to market research. And that's what I always say is that when you are making decisions on your book as the publisher, it's your job to go out and to do the market research. What price should you have? Go check the market. What size book should you have? Go check the market and make sure you're looking at books that are currently selling, number one, and books that have come out in the last year, maybe two, because trends do change. And those are things that we need to think about. If you're not sure, if you're like, well, I don't know how to find them on Amazon, take, your, take yourself down to the local bookstore and look at their new release um, books or their new release table and take a look. I had a question from uh, a client recently and they're like, hey, do you have any opinion on something specific to dust jackets? And I was like, I have lots of opinions. However, I need to make sure that my opinions are currently on trend. So I went down to my local bookstore and I browsed around and I looked at what's currently selling. I asked about their, um, what books they're being asked for the most, which books sell the best. And I looked at new releases and I looked at the trends there. And so that's what we did. And we went off of that. And that is typically what you need to do. If you want to be current in the market, you've got to go check out the market and don't be afraid to go to your local bookstore and ask. Sometimes that's a really soft, beautiful lead in for asking them to stock your book later um, by actually letting them know like, hey, I'm just kind of trying to find what sells best right now in this genre. I'm an author and I want to make sure that my book is up up to standard for stores. And as long as they're not busy, they're usually very happy to chat with you. Um, I think you never know. I mean, certainly some people are like, I don't wanna talk to you and they'll just point you in their direction, but you never know how much people are willing to help and to chat with you until you start the conversation. So don't be afraid to do that. Yes, so Caroline's saying she finds Costco a good place to see trends for size and cover design. Um, that is true. However, I will say Costco tends to take more um, hardcovers and um, 
mass market books. So that is true, but do know that Costco leans heavily to hardcovers and mass market books, not so much trade published books. So, but as far as cover design and stuff like that, absolutely. All the stores, go check Walmart, check the bookstore, check all the places. Um, just when you go to a bigger retailer like Walmart, Target, Costco, know that these are companies that are chains that are that are working on a big retail level. So they are looking for not just um, what fits in their store, but what fits regionally. So sometimes it's a little bit different when you go directly to your local bookstore, opposed to if you're looking for a big regional sales. See, Ooh. got very dark and ominous here all of a sudden. I think we might be in for a storm. Someone was talking about crazy weather earlier and I think that's exactly where we are headed towards. Um, another question I got, this was actually a really good question this week and something I ran into was how do I work with a cover designer so that we are in sync with what I want? I found a really great cover designer and I love their portfolio, but in working with them, what I'm getting as far as concepts is very different than what I had in mind. This happens all the time. Uh, I actually work with authors. I work kind of as a liaison between them and the cover designer because oftentimes an author will say, "I this is my title, I want a man, and a woman on the cover and it's romance. And then they're like, so you should just know what to make. And the cover designer will say, okay. And they will go probably ask you some more questions, but then they'll go and they will say, all right, well, this is kind of on trends. This is what I'm gonna make. And they give you some concepts. And then you come back and say, that's not at all what I wanted. That's not my story. This designer is horrible, but that's not really true. <laughs> Uh, I think it's really important to keep in mind when working with an illustrator or a cover designer that you each have a job to do within your relationship. And it's important as the author or as the publisher that you are upholding your end of the contract. It is not okay to just give your information to a cover designer and say, make me a cover I will love. Unless you're going to take that at face value and just let them run with it. It is your responsibility to come up with a general concept idea to tell them, I like these types of covers and give them one or two examples of current covers and say, I like this feel. I'm open on color, but I really want big text. Um, I am going for something that feels like a James Patterson novel, or this is a spicy romance. And so I really want these elements. Because I don't know why, but there's this idea out there that cover designers should just know, they should just know what you want. But that's really impossible because what you may think is fit for a thriller may not be what the designer who works in the industry thinks of as a thriller. And they did not write your book. They have not read your book. So while they may have a synopsis, they do not necessarily know the feel of your book. And it is absolutely your job to give them that information and those tools so that you can collaborate on a great cover. Yes, and the cover designer is most likely more aware of what works versus what you're asking for. Dude, you are on fire today. Uh, I should just have you come on and answer questions for me. Um, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I've had several times where um, people say, well, I love my cover and I think it's fabulous. I say, then print it and hang it on your wall. The cover is not for you. The cover is to draw in an audience of readers. And if it's not doing that job, it doesn't matter how much you love it. It is important to listen to if you have a true professional designer or you have consultants or people that you have paid who know the industry, it is important to listen to them. That does not mean you should hate your cover. However, if they are saying you are trying to put the title up at the top so you don't ruin the artwork and they say no, 
knows, nope, the title needs to take up. And yes, it covers the artwork and that's okay. You need to listen to that kind of thing because that is what we are trained in the industry to look for. So yes, you should like it, you should love it, but you also need to be open. Another thing I see with authors too often is they know the story. They know all the particulars and all that sort of thing. And so they are looking for exactness in the cover because they are trying to portray a scene from the story. The problem is, is that your reader hasn't read the story yet. Do they care if on this road, let's say you have a road on your book and you're like, well, I mean, on this scene, she turns right and the road only has a left. No, <laughs> no, they do not care. So there are some things where we have to also remember that our point is to hook the reader. We want to give the feel. We want to set the scene. We do not have to give exactness. We want to, of course, represent what's in the story well, but we can't get into the minutia of, well, this person has a beard that's three inches long and that picture is only an inch and a half. Um, no. <laughs> that does not matter. That will trip you up and that will make it almost impossible to work with the designer. And it will, in some cases, mean that a designer does not want to work with you. Um, they may fire you as a client and you will most likely end up unhappy. So when you get to that point, it's important to step back and say, okay, what do I really like? What do I not like? Should I talk to somebody else who has not read the book and say, would you pick this up? What kind of book do you think this is? Because I think that's important. I looked at a book cover two days ago and I was looking at it and I was like, okay, this is a nonfiction self-help Christian book. And I talked to that author and he goes, you probably thought this was like a nonfiction book. Huh? And I was like, yes, I did. And he's like, well, I'm getting my cover redone because this is a science fiction book, science fiction. And I was like, oh, well, I wouldn't have guessed that. That will probably help your sales if you have a cover that falls within science fiction. And he knew it and he was already on it. But that is the power of the cover. Now, it gave the explicit detail that talked about his title. It gave like if you read the book and came back, you would understand it. But no one got it when they're just looking at it. That is, yes, you have to stop the scroll with the, with an image smaller than a postage stamp. For instance, yes, I picked up my phone, which, um, let me do a search. I'm searching on my phone. Tara, I still need to find out how to, how to put my phone on the, um, on the computer. One day I'll learn little steps. All right, so if I do science fiction book, because a lot of people, let's be honest, we search on our phones. All right, so on my phone, I know you can't really see it, but I have three different books listed on my phone. Three covers. I mean, it's literally, I don't know, what is that, like an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter for each one. That's a tiny little thing, and you've got to get my attention as I'm scrolling by. It's really got to stand out. That's why it matters that your title is really big and takes up the whole book cover. It's why we have to follow trends because you literally have this little tiny space. And a lot of people look at their cover and they're looking at just the front cover image and they put it up on their computer screen and they blow it up and they're like, oh, I love it. It's got so much detail. But the problem is, is that while you want it to look great blown up or printed, you also need to make sure that it looks great when it's itty bitty because that matters almost more than when you're looking at it big. All right, let's see. <gasps> Perfect. All right, I'm wondering what everyone suggests about giving a discount to people who at a book signing or other, oops, I lost it. Um, at a book signing or other direct from author purchase, buy more than one copy, like one for 15 and two or more for um, what I typically do. My rule of thumb is that if you um, unless you've got a series, like if it's like, hey, each book in this series is fifteen dollars. But if you buy the three book series, it's 40 bucks or something like that. 
Sure. But if they are buying like bulk copies of your book itself, I would typically not give a discount until it's three to five at minimum. Um, because, well, number one, if people are buying bulk copies, they're typically buying it as a gift and they've already decided to buy. Um, it's not something that they're, you know, if they want to buy it for a gift, they want to buy it for a gift. So I would definitely do three to five at very minimum. And that's if you're like at a fair or something trying to hand sell individual copies. If it's an organization and it's kind of your standard discount, 10 would be my minimum. So yeah, and 10 for a bulk discount if you are doing, again, an organization or something. Now, if you're at a fair or something like that, you could offer a lower, you know, a lower point. But again, why are people buying more than that if they're just kind of walking by? So uh, that's not too often unless they're buying it as a gift. And if they're buying it as a gift, they've decided to purchase it before you offer them a discount. Yes, that's a good question, Caroline. So often authors want to stand out from their genre and actually the opposite is true. Um, that happens a lot with cover design where authors are like, well, I want to stand out. I want to be different. Yes and no. You want to be different within the expectation of your reader. So can you be different because your book maybe has a slightly different cover or it's a little more edgy? You can take a risk, a risk not multiple risks. I love um, Paula Mine, uh, who is an agent, a literary agent with Talcott Notch, often says in writing, when you are an author, especially a newer author, you get one, one risk. You can do one thing different than kind of expected of you. If it's, you know, your genre and there are different things like length and the, the up and down and the protagonist, antagonist, you can take one risk per book and that includes your cover. So if you are looking for a cover that's a little bit more edgy, then you get one risk. You can't try to bend and just create your own cover design. Unless you've got a heck of a following, you've got a big name and you know people are going to buy it because you put that book out. If you're Brandon Sanderson, you can probably do that. If you are Carrie Barnum putting out a book about, I don't know, feet. I don't know why I thought of feet as the first thing, but there we go. Um, probably not. I probably need to stay very much in, in feet. You know, I should have things that look like other feet books. Um, that was such a weird example. Anyway, so you do kind of want to stand out a little bit, but you want to stand out for how good something is, not for how different it is. If you want something different, make it that your characters, make it that your characters are mo more diverse or that, you know, there's not a hero complex for the women or make it that, you know, you took it a little bit further that you did something in your writing. Your cover really needs to, again, follow expectations. You want to follow trends or else it's going to stand out in a really bad way. Let's see. I have a series with the first cover being orange and red and green and the second cover pink and green. What strikes you as a color palette for the third and final book? Um, I don't think that color palette necessarily drives. I think it's overall theme and feel. So we want books to kind of feel like they belong. We want books and series that that feel right. So color palette does play into it, but that's not the driving factor. It's the imagery, it's the font on the text. It's that kind of thing that follows through um, because that's what we're looking for. And I want to show you, um, I want to show you a couple of examples that I think are important. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull them up before I share my screen. Look at me being so efficient today. All right. All right, all right. One more. I'll give you three examples. Look at me. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of different genres here so that I can do this for you. Um, There we go. All right, 
Let me give you three examples in different genres, if my computer will work, and I will share my screen, because you know me, I like to share the screen. Okay, let me show you a couple of examples off the top of my head that I think are great. All right, this is a romance series. And when we take a look at the series, we have, I mean, this looks like they belong together. It looks like part of the series. Now, one of the things that we'll notice on these covers is that every title is more than, more than the game, more than fine, more than uh, a hero. And the more and the than is the same every time. It's white, it's got the same um, font on it. And then the other part, the big, the game, fine, hero, that is also the same font. These look consistent. They're different colors, they're different images, but they feel cohesive. Um, also, you will notice on every single cover here, we have a couple embracing, um, you know, full uh, headshots, it's closer. This is thematically close. Now, are they the same colors? No. Do they look good when you line them up together? Well, I think so. Are they on genre? Yes, they sure are. These are the things we want to look at more than just a color palette or more than just what Again, does this really portray in detail what each book is about? Nope. What does it tell us? Well, we've got the title and then it tells us it's romance. We see a couple. This is probably in summer. They look pretty happy. Well, this one's probably set in winter. I mean, she's wearing a parka, so it's possible. This, yeah, I mean, again, it's romance. It's a couple. So that's kind of what we're looking at more. We don't have to tell the story on our book cover we have to pull people in so that they want to read about the story in our marketing copy. We don't have to tell the whole story in our book cover. That's another mistake I see very often. Then I wanna show you, um, this one is Dan Flynn again, and he's got the Peter O'Keefe series. In this series right here, they're thrillers. And again, we find things that have the same, um, font. They look cohesive. Dan's name is the same on all three covers. It's got the same font. It's got the same kind of feel, that thrillerish kind of feel. They're not the same, but they feel the same. And that's what we're looking for in a series. We're looking for cohesiveness. Um, do I recommend following the format of the font if they're if they aren't in a series. I will say that if you have standalone novels, if you have standalone books and they're all by the same author in the same genre, sometimes having the same font or having a common, a common thread can really brand that author. I think when you don't have a series, you have to think about how you're branding the author, especially if the books are in the same genre and you want there to be more read over. The more threads that we can attach between books, especially standalones, the more read through you will get. With a series, you have that read through because of the characters and because of the stories themselves. When you are doing standalone books as an author, you have to create the connection. Well, I really like this book. The cover looks kind of the same. So it's probably the same genre. That's how you get to read through. So does it have to be exactly the same? No, but I would think branding and what you want to be there. Is it the feeling? Is it the type of illustration or cover? Is it a photo cover, illustration cover that ties them all together? Is it a font? Is it how the author's name is represented? I do think there needs to be commonalities to brand the author together. And then this one's a classic. This, of course, is young adult, but I wanted to show you a lot of different colors. Again, what do we see here? The author's name is the same in every single one. The font here in the title is the same. Completely different imagery, different colors, but we know it's part of the series because it's got that font. It's the same format, name at the top. Then you've got the title in the body, and then you've got um, the other writing at the bottom. 
now this is a little bit different um, because of the movie, but you still got the same font, got the same font there again and there again. So that is the kind of thing that you want to take into consideration is how are you branding your series? If your books don't look, look like they belong together, well, then my friends, we have a problem. People are not going to know that's part of my series. I, um, Chris Bennett is another good one. He, I work with Chris, I have to be honest, but I think his covers are great. And I also think that he comes up with the concepts of these and he does a really great job of making sure that it's consistent. We know these are part of a series. They look like they belong together. We've got the same feel, kind of that washed out feel with a bright color. We've got the same font up there. His name is the same on every single book cover. And he gets great read through of his series. Now, part of that is the writing, but part of that is the branding of the cover. So even though we have different imagery, we have these common threads. And I think that's so important to think about is will your reader, if your reader sees this on a shelf, will it catch their eye and say, oh, that's Kim's book? Will it catch their eye and say, I've read that? That is what we want. We want people to feel familiar with our books. We want them to recognize our books so that they recognize it's something they want to read and that they will enjoy or that they've already started the series and they want to come back to it. So, so many things that go into cover design. This is why I say often, I'm not a cover designer. I would never dare try to create a cover. Um, however, I can see the trends. I can see the things because I, I've trained to do that. And I think it's important that when you are creating a cover that you work with someone who's either a professional cover designer or someone who's been trained, who knows what to look for. So you can stay on trend and that you can remove yourself a little bit. It can be very emotional for an author with a cover because they want it to tell the story. That's not the job of a cover. A cover's job is to get reader attention and the right reader attention. Your marketing copy is meant to hook the reader and tease the story. That's the job. The book's job is to tell the story, not your cover. So that's really important to know. These are, again, those little minutia things that um, set good enough and excellent apart. And I think it's really, really important. And I think it's important to realize that when you hire a cover designer, you have a job to do as much as they do. And you want to be a good partner with that cover designer to make sure that you have a successful project, which everyone wants. Yes, I do. If you go to new shelves and you go to the resources tab, there's a um, something there that says people we like, and there are cover designers there. You can find cover designers on 99designs, on Fiverr. Go to your favorite book series that is a good comp and see if they list their cover designer. There are so many ways to find cover designers, but even within a good cover designer, you have to be open to letting them share their expertise with you. Um, because I've had, I've had authors who say, well, I'm the one paying for it, so I'm going to do what I want. And they will take a fantastic cover designer and end up with a crappy cover because they weren't letting people who are experts in their field do what they were hired to do. So you got to play a part in it for sure. All right, you guys, it's a little after 11. Um, I know a lot of people are kind of off for the holiday weekend. I know my kids are already on spring break. So you guys, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I will look forward to reconnecting next week, same time, same place. And don't forget, you can join us live at newshelves.com slash FAF. And you can also email your questions in, uh, in advance if you'd like. Info at newshelves.com. We'll see you next week. Bye.